that hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. Um, I'd just like to put in a request now that that is how you end my funeral. Um, not that that's scheduled, but um, <laughs> because it is the truth. We don't always feel that way. Sometimes we sing that song because it is true despite how we feel. But it is the truth. And it is a remarkable truth when you take into consideration the passage that Bailey just read for us. I was reminded as I was working on this uh, passage about um, the great Safeway heist. You may or may not know about that. Um, I think I was about 10 years old. And my parents had divorced. I was living in Oregon at that time, and my dad was living in Los Angeles. And I used to spend every, you know, good part of every summer flying down to L.A., and I'd hang out with my dad and his family. And he had two daughters that were about my same age. Um, I don't understand the next part of this story, because my dad, by that point, was retired from being a police officer, and he should have known better. But he dropped the three of us off at a Safeway in Los Angeles, handed us some money, said, go have fun, and he took off and ran errands. Who drops off 10-year-old kids unattended in Los Angeles? Apparently, my father or the ex-cop. Um, well, I don't know what I was doing. I was playing outside, doing something and my sisters went inside, and after a little bit, they came out with a load of candy, which I didn't think much of because Dad had given us money, until the manager came out and marched all three of us into his office until Dad got there. It didn't matter how much I protested. It didn't matter how much I said I was outside. It didn't matter how much I said I was innocent, that I was just being guilty by association. My dad did what made this memory last to me now 43 years later. He put us in a car. He took us to a police station so we could see the trajectory of our lives. And then he punished us. And I think about that because I look at it and say, that was so completely unfair. How could he do this to us? I wasn't even part of the group. I was just being made guilty by association. As Paul is working through Romans, the passage that we're at this morning is a refutation of anyone saying, I am guilty before God just by association. Now, let's remember what's going on in the book of Romans. Paul is writing to a church or actually a group of churches that he has not yet visited. From the book of Acts we see that in all likelihood, the church in Rome was started around A.D. 33, because we see in the book of Acts, there are Jews from Rome who were present at Pentecost. They come to Christ, and they go back to Rome. Over the course of years, you have Gentiles that come to Christ, and that makes up the church or churches in Rome. About 16 years later, in A.D. 49, the Caesar, the emperor, is really tired of the Jews. They are annoying him, and he kicks them all out of Rome, and that includes all the Jewish Christians. So now the churches are being run by Gentiles. And as the Jews come back into Rome about 10 years later, maybe a little less, these Jewish Christians come back to their churches and discover that everything that they thought about how a church should run, what makes a church right, with, right and good and, and allows you to be right with God, was looking different. Instead of looking Jewish, it was looking very Gentilish. And if there was an outright conflict, which there probably was, there was at least confusion. 
And so Paul is going to answer the question, how do you work all this out? How do you make sense of all of this? And he does it by saying, it's not a matter of the church looking Jewish or Gentilish. It's a matter of the church looking gospelish. And as we come to grips with the gospel, we understand how it changes our relationships with one another, changes our relationships with the Lord, and changes the nature of what we do here. Now, we've been seeing that uh, Paul divides Romans into basically two different sections. The first section, Paul is going to argue. Let's come back here. Paul is going to argue that righteousness, which is the, kind of the key theme to this book, comes from God. And then in the second part of the book, he says, those who have received righteousness live a certain way. They live by faith. And this first section is divided into four parts. And we are closing out that first of those four parts, which is why do we need righteousness? And Paul in these four parts has said that everyone is under God's wrath. Even those, this would be the Gentiles, who never had the law. That's not an excuse. The Jews, you had the law. But that doesn't give you some special out with God. You still have to deal with your mess. And he's going to wrap up today by saying everyone, absolutely everyone, is in need of righteousness because no one can be righteous by their own efforts. And here's the key insight that comes in this last section. It's not just about you're guilty because you're a Gentile. It's not just about you're guilty because you're a Jew. It's you as an individual. This is not guilt by association. You see, so often when we talk about everyone as a sinner, what goes on in our mind is something like, yeah, 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 mainly them. I'm kind of impressive. But Paul says, buddy, I am talking to you. And that's where he's going in today's passage. And what he's going to do as he goes there is he is going to make a charge, an accusation. He's going to give evidence for it. He's going to show the consequences of it. And then I want to spend some time talking about an invitation for how to live in light of what Paul has said. But first the charge, and that's in verse 9, and it's that we are trapped under the power of sin. Now, when Bailey first read verse 9, if you actually were thinking back to last week at all, there was something that might have sounded like a contradiction. Last week, we looked at the first part of Romans chapter 3. And remember how he starts off Romans chapter 3. What advantage has the Jew? Answer, much in every way. Then we get down here to verse 9. Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. Before I get into that, I want to point something out to you. This little word, we. Paul is identifying with them. He's not saying, oh, you guys. He's saying us, me. First person. The reason this is kind of looks like a disadvantage is, remember, he's really talking about two different things. We saw this last week. The advantage that the Jews had is that they had the law. They had the things, that the, the marks of being a part of the people of God. And that gave them a real advantage, a huge blessing in knowing who God is and knowing what, God's want, what God wants in a relationship. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't give them the actual relationship. They still have the mess in their lives, the unrighteousness that they have to deal with. And Paul is saying in verse 9, just because you have those things doesn't mean that God just looks the other way about your mess. Jews, Gentiles, you are all in the same boat. You are all unrighteous. There is no advantage when it comes to entering into a relationship with God. 
Now, there are two words in verse 9 I really want to highlight. One is the word charged. I find that to be an interesting word because of what he doesn't say. What he doesn't say is, I have argued. I have convinced you. What he's done is he simply made an accusation. He's made a declaration. He has said, this is what is true about you. What is true about you is you are under sin. And what fascinates me is that he doesn't have to make the argument because they know it's true. Right? Don't you know it's true? Do I have to make an argument? Do I have to go person by person? Let's start with Slade. Sitting over here. And let's list things that he's said or things that he's done, attitudes that he's had, thoughts that he's had that would convince you that he's not righteous. And then do we have to go through every person? Or can I just say, you're under sin. Because if you are honest with yourself for 30 seconds, you will say guilty. Guilty. Now, what does this under sin mean? That's the second word I want us to focus on, under this was actually a way of referring to, to authority, right? This is the type of terminology or language that was used in the Greek language. If you were talking about a commanding, soldier, a commanding officer and the soldiers that were under him, it would be used for talking about a king and the subjects that were under him. It refers to absolute rule, complete control, the domination over someone's life. And the idea is this is what sin is to you. It is a dominating, controlling force of your life. And so if you were here when we looked at Romans 1, you just think back to Romans 1 and Paul is saying that things like gossip and greed and, and disobedience and pride and being condescending and rebellious, these are the sorts of things that controlled them and potentially control everyone. See, the charge of verse 9 is that everyone starts from the same point when it comes to our relationship with God. We start, before we know Christ, we start trapped under sin. Before we know Christ, we start with sin dominating us. And there is nothing we can do about it. Now, later in Romans, Paul is going to say that we're freed from this trap. We don't live under this trap of sin if you know Christ. But he's not there yet. That's not where he is in Romans. He is setting a foundation and he is saying, you've got to understand before you came to Christ where you started. And where you started was trapped in sin and under its dominion. Let's pause here for a second. What you think Jesus has actually done for you what you think was going on on the cross depends very much on what you think your starting point was. I just read this week about a young man uh, here in the U.S. He was working in a grocery store. And um, he met a son of a family that was extremely poor. And so this guy, actually what the guy explained is, as a Christian, I felt like I, I needed to be involved. This is someone created in, Christ, in God's image, someone that Christ died for. I can't just ignore this. And so he got involved. And he ended up meeting this family, and they were extreme poverty. And he raised money to provide food for this family, housing for this family, and even education and ultimately college education for this family. The amount of money that he raised was life-changing. And if he had raised that exact same amount of money for a billionaire, wouldn't have given it a second thought. It wouldn't have mattered one bit. We may not think that we are spiritual billionaires before we come to Christ. 
but we certainly tend to think that we are spiritually middle class before we came to Christ. That we're pretty comfortable and we're doing okay. Paul is saying the reality is that you were as spiritually impoverished as it is possible to have been impoverished. And if you don't understand this, if we don't understand this, then we don't understand what was happening on the cross. And then Paul drives home this point in the next major section of this passage by listing a whole bunch of quotes from the Old Testament. And these quotes come like bullet points. And what Paul is doing is he's saying, look, even in the Old Testament, it makes this point. It is proof that you were desperately, hopelessly under the power of sin. Now, you can take these quotes that appear in verses 10 through 18 and really divide them into three groups. And the first group is in verses 10 through 12. And what this is doing is it's making clear that he's talking to individuals. There is no individual who can claim to be righteous. The heart of every person has strayed from God. Look at what is repeated throughout this section. None is righteous. No, not one, not a single individual. No one understands. In other words, no one has spiritual insight. No one pursues God. All, absolutely everyone has turned aside from God, has turned away. Together, you put them all together, they have become worthless, meaning they are of no help in spiritual guidance or spiritual insight. No one does good, not even one. Paul is emphasizing, as he is quoting quoting the Old Testament, That even in the Old Testament, it's making it very clear that every individual has turned away from God. They have been led astray, and there is no morally good. And we read that, and if we're honest, we say, that's not right. Wait a minute. I know all kinds of really good, nice, moral people, very generous people who aren't Christians, who don't know Christ. And the reality is, Paul would have too. So what's he saying here? Go back to Romans 1. What is it that makes sin, sin? What is it that makes unrighteousness, unrighteous? Do you remember the word? Idolatry. Every very nice, generous person can do wonderful, wonderful things. But that is not the issue. The issue is what is the center of their life? Is it the God of the Bible? The issue is who do they try to lift up and elevate with their lives? Is it the God of the Bible? What do they depend on for their well-being? Is it God of the Bible? Because if it's not the God of the Bible for any of those questions, then they are living out idolatry and they are... And they are leading others into idolatry, whether they mean it or not, with the best of intentions. And Paul is saying that was every single one of us. He goes on in the next section of Old Testament quotes, which are in verses 13 and 14. And he shows that the power of sin is evident in our words that wound. Our sinfulness extends to every aspect of life, including what we say, including what we put on Facebook, including what we tweet. He says that their throat is an open grave. That means their throat is is something that reveals an ugliness, a repulsiveness, an uncleanness. Out of that throat comes deception. Deception. Venom as of asp is under their lips. This word that's translated asps is actually the word that would be translated today as cobra. And they would have known, and so it's very possible that what Paul is thinking about are cobras that spit venom. That's the picture. When these people speak, it's like they are cobras who are spitting venom. Their mouth is full of curses. In other words, their mouth is full of threats. Their mouth is full of of plans to carry out those threats. 
and what they say is harsh and is bitter. The proof of the power of sin is in the deep, deep damage that is caused by our words. More proof of the power of sin is in the actions that destroy. Verses 15 through 18. Paul ends this section of Old Testament quotes by pointing out what we do and the effect that it has. Their feet, which is a way of saying their actions, are swift to shed blood. This word swift is really interesting in Greek. It combines two ideas. It combines the idea of something being very sharp, like a sword, and being very quick. So it's like a master swordman who has a very sharp sword and is able to use it very skillfully and use it in a way that causes extraordinary damage. Their paths, that's their way of life, leads to ruin, leads to destruction and misery. This word misery would create a word picture in their mind. It would create a picture of complete destruction. What we might think about today in this part of the country is if you've ever seen the aftermath of a tornado and how it just wipes everything out. That's what their ways of life led to. It led to destruction and complete waste. And they do not know peace in how they live. Their lives are characterized by conflict. Their lives are characterized by struggle. Paul is painting an ugly picture of what the Romans were like before they knew Christ. They had turned away from God. Their words and their actions destroyed people. And we have to recognize that just as he was talking about them, he was talking about us as well. This is what we were like before we came to know Christ. And our response should be one of complete and utter gratitude that we are no longer trapped in that. But there should be another response as well. There should be an honesty that the picture that he paints of these Romans before they knew Christ is a picture that we still resemble in a lot of ways. There's a lot of ways, if we think back just this last week, that we were unkind or thoughtless in what we said or what we posted. Can you think of ways that you made someone feel small or you made someone feel unloved? Think about your actions this past week. Where has there been selfishness that has cost someone something? Where has there been conflict instead of peace? He is talking about Romans before Christ, but it's a picture that still lingers with us, even as we seek to follow Christ. And verse 18 really captures the heart of it. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In other words, they live as if God does not exist. There is no consideration for the character of God. They don't think of God as being present. They don't think of God as seeing their actions. They don't think of God as holding them accountable for anything. No matter what they say, no matter what they might profess, they live day to day as if they are atheists. And sometimes so do we. Verses 10 through 18, Paul uses the Old Testament to describe every person's condition apart from Christ. And we might say to ourselves, well, I was never that bad. But no one can say, no one can say that I have never wounded with my words. No one can say I have never hurt with my actions. No one can say that they have always pursued God's glory over everything else and have fully relied on him. And so Paul's point is made. No one is righteous. Everyone is trapped under the power of sin. Do you need evidence? Do you need proof? Just look around and look into your own life. Listen to the words that wound. Watch the actions that destroy. 
look into hearts that so easily turn from God. And then Paul ends this section with the reality that we are all accountable for it. We are accountable for the power of sin in our lives. And these words that Paul writes would have resonated with every Jew who is hearing this. Whatever the law says, whatever God's word says, to those who are under the law, who's that? They would have said, put their hand up and said, well, that's everybody. The law applies to everyone. Everyone, the whole world, will be held accountable to God. In other words, everyone is guilty. Now, this might be my favorite part of the passage. Every mouth may be stopped. This word stopped is the word for shut. This is the first time in human history someone said, shut your mouth. And what Paul is saying here is when you come face to face with the reality, you sit there and you have nothing to say in your defense. There is no excuse. Actions have damaged. And there is nothing you can say that makes that all right. Words have wounded. And there's nothing you can say that just makes that go away. Our actions, our words, our attitudes, our rebellion and an affront to the God who loves us perfectly. And then verse 20 drives home the point that there's nothing you can do to get yourself out of that mess. For by the works of the law, just think the do's and don'ts that are in the Bible. No human being will be justified. That is declared right in God's sight. You see what he's saying? You can't do enough good deeds to offset the sin in your life and the unrighteousness, the idolatry in your life. You can't be nice enough. Why? Because that's not what the, the do's and don'ts of the Bible are all about. They're not to free you. They're not meant to free you from the trap. They are meant to point out that you're in a trap. And as Paul is going to say later in Romans, the freedom out of the trap is taking Jesus as your savior and trusting him. And that is the only way out. Remember what Paul is doing in this section of Romans. He is showing why we need the righteousness that comes from God through Jesus. We need that righteousness because we are incapable of generating it on our own. That's what he's been saying these last four sermons. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew. And I'm talking to every single one of you individually. You stand guilty before God and there is nothing that you can do about it. And that is exactly Paul's point in this passage. And it's his point in this section. You stand guilty before God. We cannot generate righteousness on our own. We can't break out of the trap of sin on our own. No amount of good deeds will be enough. You can't be nice enough. And that's because the root issue is idolatry. You cannot break out of putting ourselves ahead of God without his intervention. And so now I want to invite you into a life that is lived according to that reality. And that is a life of repentance. There is a very bright dead guy by the name of Martin Luther. Um, you may be familiar that Martin Luther was a monk, and he was concerned about some of the things going on in the church. And he wrote what are called the 95 Theses. So 95 statements where basically he was just raising questions about have we as a church departed from what Scripture is saying? He wrote 95 of these sorts of, of comments that he was opening up for discussion. 
this is number one on the list. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he meant the entire life of believers should be one of repentance. That was declaration number one from Martin Luther. And I think it's an extraordinary invitation for us. We are called as believers to live a life of repentance. Growing up, I thought of repentance as saying I'm sorry to God and, you know, I might end my day with a fast prayer to, to get me clear with God. And yet when the Bible talks about repentance, it talks about so much more. It means the turning or returning to a faithful relationship with God. It involves the ongoing, persistent refusal to compromise with sin. It is a whole person, every day, response to God as he deals with sin in our lives. And I want to suggest a life of repentance can be captured in four words that begin with the letter C. And the first word is conviction, which speaks of our knowledge of sin. When we do something that displeases God, we are made aware of it. And usually it's accompanied by something that's kind of a sinking feeling that we would really strongly prefer to to avoid and ignore. That's the Holy Spirit knocking on our brain saying, hey, you did something wrong. It needs to be addressed. Let me give you an example from my own life. I'm going to use myself as an example throughout this. There is someone in my life that none of you know, does not live here in Longview, that if I'm really honest, whenever I see her or hear from her, or I'm around her, second I lay eyes on her, the very first strong response is, I am annoyed and I am dismissive. She does not have to say a word. She just has to come into my field of vision. I have to, she doesn't have to necessarily have to do that. I can just have to know that she's on the phone. And that is my response. And whenever I do that, there's this little knock on my brain that says, that's not right. You can't have that added toward, towards people. And what's going on there in my life is conviction. Now, very often, my response to conviction is just a quick prayer, and I hope that sinking feeling goes away, and then I want to move on. But the reality is that a life of repentance involves a lot more than that. Along with conviction, there is contrition. That is sorrow over sin. It's remorse for the dishonor that we have done to the God we are learning to love and wanting to serve. It is not, by the way... The self-centered, I don't want God to punish me. How can I get rid of it? Sorrow is the sorrow that we have hurt someone we love and who loves us. You see, the right emotional response to my conviction about being annoyed with this person that I just saw from a distance is sorrow. Right emotional response to conviction is remorse or sorrow. But the reality is, a lot of times, I don't feel anything. I just feel annoyed. So what do I do? What I need to do is slow down and think. What I need to do is process. What is it? about the words I've said or the actions I've taken, or in my example, the attitude that I have developed that is offensive to God? What is it about the sin that actually required Jesus to go to the cross? I mean, look, she doesn't even know how I'm thinking or feeling. No one's hurt by this. But Jesus went to the cross for it. Why? I'm not trying to shame myself. I'm not trying to manufacture emotion. And I'm not beating myself up. All I need to do is set the truth in front of me. Genuine remorse is more likely if we understand the true nature of what we've done. And what we have done is an offense to God. And it is something that required Jesus to go to the cross 
So maybe what we need to do is just slow down and think about that before we move on. You see, I need to recognize that my response to this person is a self-centered declaration to God that I know better than he does. Why? Because what's God's response to that person? Love. He's not annoyed. He's not dismissive. He loves her. Basically, what I'm saying to God is that I know better than you do how to relate to this person, and that is idolatry. I'm saying to God that my opinion matters more. Conviction, contrition, and that needs to be followed by confession. And confession is not a quick word to get out of being punished. It is taking ownership of sin. It is taking full ownership before God of what we have done. Have you ever noticed that when you confess sin, maybe this is just me. I'm not really asking for forgiveness. I'm asking for God to ignore what I've done or to excuse it. See, because if God ignores what I've done, then it really wasn't that bad. And if God will accept my excuses, then I really didn't do anything that wrong. But if I go to God and confess with an attitude of forgiveness, then what I am saying is that I fully acknowledge that what I did was wrong. There are no excuses. It puts me at God's mercy to pardon me. Do you remember I pointed this out in verse 9? Paul started with we. He started with the first person. Confession always starts with the first person. This is what I have done. Confession always names what we have done and calls it for the evil that it is. And confession always includes reverently asking God for his mercy, for him to clear our conscience, for him to forgive us as he says that he will, and to help us avoid the sin in the future. When I think about this person that I have this automatic annoyed response with, my confession needs to look something like, Father, I have mistreated someone you love by having such a bad attitude about them. No excuses. That is hurtful to you, and in fact, it is evil. And so I appeal to your mercy to clear my conscience and to help me avoid doing this again. Thank you that you have placed all of the guilt for my sin on Jesus. That's confession. There's a fourth C in a life of repentance, and it's correction. Correction is to put deliberate thought into how to keep clear of that sin in the future. I had a conversation with someone recently. I'm not even sure I remember who it was, even though it was like this last week. Um, I think it was a woman, and she said to me, she was telling me about someone who's hurt her again and again and again. And, um, and she made the excuse for him, well, he didn't really mean to. And I thought about that for a second, and I said back to her, but he didn't mean not to. Here's, and I explain, here's what I mean. He took absolutely no steps, no efforts whatsoever to keep from doing this to you again and again. And this person can keep coming back and saying, I'm sorry, and I'm sorry, and I'm sorry. And at some point, if there are no steps to avoid hurting her in the future, we eventually say to ourselves, I think his sorry is actually just really selfish. What he's really saying is, I don't want to fix anything in the relationship. I just want to be off the hook. See, correction goes beyond saying, I want to be off the hook. It's fixing the wrong that was done and preparing to not do it again. If you have gossiped to someone about someone else, 
You have done real damage to that person you've gossiped about, whether they know it or not. And an appropriate part of correction would almost always be going back to that person that you gossip to and saying, look, I said this about that person that was wrong. Let's understand how God looks at that person, which I lost sight of. By the way, that'll be a great deterrent for you uh, from gossiping again. It means preparing to step into the situation where you know you're going to be confronted with the temptation to sin again. For this person that I'm annoyed with, it means being prepared when I see her from around her, preparing myself, reminding myself as that moment approaches that this is someone created in the image of God for whom Christ died. And how dare I treat her any way other than that? What I'm suggesting is that the life of repentance is the daily practice of responding to the conviction that the Holy Spirit brings into your life with sorrow, with taking ownership of your sin, no excuses, and then turning away from that sin and towards obedience to God, taking practical steps. A life of repentance is a life of doing this every single day, all throughout the day, as the Holy Spirit convicts you. That is, I think, how Paul would want us to respond to this passage. We have just completed four really downer sermons. This section of Romans is all about Paul saying, Buddy, you are messed up. And there is nothing you can do about it. And you need to own it. You need to own your mess. We can't go around saying, I'm not that bad, or I had good reason for it, because we just minimize what Christ did for us on the cross. See, apart from Jesus, we are trapped in rebellion against God. And no amount of good deeds, no amount of niceness can get us out of that mess. And Paul starts here because he wants us to grasp the magnitude of what Jesus did on the cross. Because what Jesus did on the cross is he took all of the guilt, all of the punishment, Everything that should be ours because of all of that wretchedness Paul has just talked about. And he said, I take it on me. So that when God looks at you, if you trust in me instead of yourself, if you trust in me, when God looks at you, he says, not guilty. When God looks at you, what he actually sees, and this is where Paul is going in Romans, what he actually sees is the perfect righteousness of Christ instead of the unrighteousness that we were trapped in before Christ. The good news of Jesus is not that he came to make nice people nicer. The good news of Jesus is that he came to give freedom and forgiveness to a world that was trapped under sin. And that includes every one of us. So what do we do in response? Some ideas to kind of kickstart a life of repentance. Can we say this every week? I'm loving seeing this on Facebook. People are starting to post their rewrites on Facebook. Rewrite the passage in your own words. It will really help the truth of it sink in. I say the some version of this every week too, knowing full well that when I say it, it strikes fear in your heart. Share with someone one area where the power of sin is evident in your life. We don't want to go there. What we would rather do is have people think that we are righteous than actually be righteous. What sharing our struggles does is it forces us to say out loud, I am a sinner who struggles. 
and it allows someone near us to make God's love for us tangible as they say back to us, I love you and I will be with you through this. The profound power of that is life-changing, but we are usually too afraid to take that step. Practice. This was from last week, but I repeated it this week because I wanted us to see it in context. This is why daily confession to the Lord is so important. It's part of a life of repentance. If we make that something that we do every day throughout the day as we are convicted by sin, as as we feel contrition over sin, and we go to the Lord and take ownership of it, it becomes life-changing. And then prayer. Ask the Lord to deepen your hatred for sin. Do you understand? Do you embrace? Does it sink deeply into you? that your sin is rebellion and an affront to the God who loves you more than anyone has ever loved you before. If you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, I know I am guilty. I know I am trapped under sin and I want to be freed. There is a way out and that way out is Christ. And what you do is you go to Christ and you say to him, I am guilty and I want to be freed, which means I want to follow you and be like you. To do that, I am trusting that what you did on the cross was enough to get me right with God. And I'm going to stop trusting my own good works and my own niceness because that'll never be enough. Jesus described it this way. Repent, believe, follow him. As we do that, God says, I declare you not guilty. There are some here that says, I've done that, but I still live like I'm I'm trapped under sin. This is when you share with someone where where you feel trapped and what you're struggling with. And there are people here who, yeah, I still struggle with sin, but I have experienced this freedom. I have lived walking with Christ. I have been his follower. I know what the struggle is like, and I know what the freedom is like. And you need to be available to those people in the first two groups that they can talk to you. So your responsibility is to look around. Who are the people that God is bringing into your life who are in those first two groups? We're going to close in prayer, and I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. And these folks are going to be up here when we end the service. They'll be here to pray with you. If you're in any of those three groups, I'd encourage you to come forward and share, especially if you're in the first or second group. All of these folks are in the third group. If you're struggling with finances or relationships, if you're struggling with the direction of life, career struggles, just anything that you want someone to stand with you and go before the Lord, that's what they're here for. And they'd love to pray with you. So could we stand and enter into prayer together? Heavenly Father, we read a passage like this, the passages that we've had the last four weeks, and they are hard convicting, challenging passages. We don't leave here feeling like we're energized or or we're pumped up. We leave here with the weight of the sin that is a part of our lives and the conviction that comes with it on our shoulders. And so, Lord, we come to you and we confess that we are people whose hearts have gone astray from you, We are people whose words have wounded and our actions have destroyed. Lord, we are guilty and we do not make excuses. We own it. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to live differently. And Lord, even as we confess these things, even as we ask you to clear our conscience, Lord, we know that you do. We know that as we confess, the weight is lifted. We know that the full 
penalty of our sin was placed on Jesus and we do not have to carry it anymore. We know that we can be free and we can live free. And we thank you for that blessing. And we ask that you would help us today to live in that freedom. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So let me leave you with this thought. Here's what this passage has said about who God is today. It has said that God has way, God has, has accurately assessed that we are guilty. But in that passage, there is hope that he has given us a way out of the trap of sin. So our charge is to live here, living in a life of repentance. You're dismissed.